Welcome back. I hope your discussions were fruitful. Ours was certainly interesting and fruitful. So I hope that your groups were uh, were honest and transparent. I know a couple of the questions were a little rough, a little confrontational, but hopefully they'll spur us on to more study and taking a deeper look at God's Word. And uh, I think it's really okay to confirm in all of us that Jesus Christ is working in us to transform us in the image of Christ, and we certainly rejoice at that. Especially because the next chapter is dealing with the fall of mankind. After creation, a perfect garden, a glorious creation, glorious heavens, glorious earth, a loving God who wants relationship with people, all of a sudden this, this blight on all of human history happens, and this is such an important thing to understand. Without understanding the fall of mankind, then you have no need of a gospel and you have no projection toward a gospel. The, the seeds for the gospel are planted in the garden as we understand Adam and Eve and their rebellion. And what needed to be restored and forgiven in their lives is the same need that we have today. So understanding the fall of mankind is so incredibly essential in our Christian anthropology. The, the word we use is fall, the fall of mankind. What do we fall from? We fell from a gracious relationship with a loving God into the abysmal pit of sin, and we pay the price even still today. Those of us who don't know Christ, still living spiritually dead lives apart from God, those of us who do know Christ still deal with the implications of the sin all around us, and even some of the resident sin that remains in our lives. The fall is a, such a determinative thing in our doctrine of mankind, so we have to deal with this. The fall was centered around a tree. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 16, God had warned that of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Death was not a thing in the garden. Death did not exist in the garden. It didn't exist until the fall. What we need to understand is, um, is that there was nothing magical about the tree. There wasn't some knowledge resident in the trunk and, and pieces of good and evil in the leaves. The tree was a tree with fruit, and the tree was given to mankind as a point of obedience and loyalty. When God told Adam and Eve, don't eat of the tree, it's not like they would eat the tree and all of a sudden become godlike in knowledge. It's because the tree itself represented rebellion. It represented disobedience. And the tree broke the heart of God and certainly led to the sacrifice of his only son. But the tree itself was just a fruit-bearing tree. And, um, and the fact that God gave only one stricture in the, all of the garden, only one restriction, all of the garden was for them. They could play, they could eat, they could run, they could exercise, they could enjoy, they could eat anything they saw, but just this one tree. Just this one tree. Stay away from the one tree Show your loyalty, your obedience, and your love by staying away from just that one tree. And we revealed in the book of Genesis the fact that Adam and Eve could not resist that temptation. They fell to the temptation, and that's an extremely important point because that's going to be restored later on in Christ Jesus. But the tree of knowledge of good and evil, they were commanded, you shall not eat, for in that day death will enter humanity. Since that point, death and disease entered humanity. All of the sin that we see around us results in death. The Word of God is so clear that in the garden there was perfect health and perfect provision and perfect safety and perfect rest. Even the diseases that we deal with today, although we don't believe that God gives a person a particular disease because of a particular sin, the fact is, though, that all sickness, all disease, all decay entered the world at that time and all of the distress around us is the result of the sin that was perpetrated in the garden. Okay, So it's a big thing to understand. The tree, this is important to understand, the tree once again was not magical. Don't, don't believe that there was something about the trunk or the fruit that was going to give them some kind of godlike knowledge or there was some kind of mystical presence in the leaves. The, the fact of the matter is this, that the tree was Adam and Eve's opportunity to demonstrate their obedience and loyalty. And they failed. They failed to show loyalty to the one who had given them everything, who loved them perfectly, who walked with them, who lived with them, who shared life with them, who gave them life. They failed 
to express that simple obedience and loyalty, and because of that, the fall of mankind is affecting us even to this very day. The tree resulted in moral judgment, responsibility, and experience that mankind was never intended to have at that point. They were walking and living in innocence in the garden with God. They weren't lacking any needed knowledge. They weren't lacking any provision or safety or rest. They were lacking the knowledge of shame and guilt, the knowledge that results from sin and degradation and decay. And so the tree, when they disobeyed and ate the fruit of the tree, what came into their lives was shame and guilt and an awareness of their sin and the painful awareness that they were no longer worthy to be in the presence of the God they had once walked with. Okay, Now, D, Genesis chapter 3, verse 8, Romans 5, 12. Death entered the world through original sin. Along with death came shame, guilt, and expulsion from the garden, which was the place of fellowship with God. The garden was a real place. Adam and Eve were real people. What we need to understand, too, in our minds, it needs to symbolize the loss of fellowship, the loss of intimacy. No longer were Adam and Eve perfect and holy in the relationship with God. They had fallen and rebelled. Therefore, there was a brokenness in the relationship that they had with God. And when they were cast out of garden, when they were cast out of the Garden of Eden, they were cast out of that place of intimate, loving fellowship. Death in other world, disease, sickness, war, violence, selfishness, sickness, shame, and guilt all entered along on the heels of death. And that's the price we've paid ever since then for the fall of mankind. Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 5, deals with the temptation that, uh, that Adam and Eve were tempted by this rebellion. They were tempted to eat this fruit, to pursue this rebellion. They were tempted and they failed. Satan appeared to them in the form of a serpent. Um, it's kind of important we don't get hung on the appearance or look of this serpent. Was it dragon-like? Was it like a normal snake? Well, it doesn't really matter. Satan appeared in the form of some kind of a serpent. The principle we need to understand is that even today, Satan still prefers not to be seen or known for who he really is. That when temptation comes to us for wrong thinking or for fleshly behavior, selfishness, uh, violence, all those temptations that come into our lives, Satan is not going to appear to us in his actual real form. He's going to appear to us in hidden form. The lies that are communicated, the, the death that's dealt into our life, it's from hidden sources. We would never look and say, ah, oh, that's the serpent Satan, unless we know spiritually, unless we discern spiritually where the source of lies is. Satan is still the liar, the deceiver, the, and, and God has a wonderful plan for your life, and Satan has a perfectly horrible plan for your life, and if he can sucker you into temptation and self-destruction, he can still destroy us. Satan appeared in the form of a serpent in the garden, he still prefers not to be seen or known as he really is, and he still does the work of causing deception to make blinders on the eyes of the lost, that they might not see the truth of the gospel. Now, um, the first question Satan brought about was the question of God's goodness. Is he really good? Is his plan really good? He questioned the very character of God. Did God actually say, you shall not eat of the tree in the garden? This is certainly the same words from the lips of the tempter today as people question the goodness of God. When we ask questions like, how could evil exist and God be all-powerful and good and, and evil still happen? That questioning of God's ultimate goodness, it's an escape from truth and from Scripture and from the Word of God. The, the, the question he asks is still being asked by the lost world today and by deceivers today. Is God really good? The answer is, Absolutely, yes, perfectly good. The deceiver lied and convinced them that God was not truly good. Also, <clears throat> in um, verse, chapter 3, verse 4, he then denied God's justice. He denied that there are consequences for sin, saying, you shall not surely die. You're not going to die. That whole consequence thing, that whole justice thing, God's not really just. He's not going to follow through on that. The deception is still continuing today that some people even believe that God is good, but that he's not just. They want him to feel really, really safe to not be a God who's actually capable of love and wrath. 
But God is just, and Jesus Christ is the judge of the living and the dead. And so we can't deny God's justice. But this was the question raised by the tempter in the garden, questioning the justice and the righteousness of God. Now, provided the choice, Adam and Eve chose rebellious sin. They thought about it, they considered it, they discussed it, and they yielded. They brought about the fall of mankind through their rebellious, wanton sin. Now, <clears throat> remember we're talking about the doctrine of mankind. We really want to understand why the world's in the state that it's in, why humanity is in the condition it's in. It's because in the garden there was a fall. Adam and Eve chose rebellious sin. They disobeyed and were disloyal to God. Since then, we have all been brought into this original sin. We've all been born in sin, and then we continue to sin in the way that Adam and Eve did sin. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 14 reveals that Eve was deceived. This is the interesting, this is why this is blamed on Adam, because Eve was deceived. She was tricked, but Adam sinned willfully. Because this is what the word says, for Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. See, Adam at this point could have said, I wasn't born yesterday. He, he knew what was happening. When Eve was deceived and she fell and she rebelled, Adam followed along as a choice of willful disobedience. Okay? Now, <clears throat> here's the beautiful thing that we need to hang on to, that when you see the temptation of Jesus Christ in Matthew 4, verses 1 through 11, Remember, the Holy Spirit led Jesus to the desert, fasted, prayed, sought the Lord. He was tempted three times. And what we need to see is Adam, as the covenantal head of the people of God, uh, fell into sin and disobedience and destroyed everything. And then Jesus Christ also was tempted by the same serpent, by the same wicked liar, but Jesus succeeded. He said no to the temptation and continued to be loyal and obedient to the Father to follow the will of the Father, and to walk in the holiness of the Father. Where Adam and Eve failed to resist temptation, Jesus succeeded. The sinfulness of Adam and Eve is the antithesis of the purity and holiness of Jesus Christ, who never sinned, who never did any deed of rebellion or flesh, who never separated himself from the Father because of sin. So, the covenantal heads, Adam, the first man who fell, and Jesus Christ, the second Adam, the one who succeeded where Adam failed and brought redemption to mankind. Now, it resulted in broken fellowship with God. This is the tragedy of the garden. This is where our hearts go out to lost men and women who have no relationship with God. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 8, where Adam and Eve should have still been having nice walks with God in the cool of the day in the garden. It says this, that when the fall happened, because shame and guilt entered their hearts, they became aware of their nakedness, and their nakedness became something sinful. It hadn't been before. It had been innocence and purity like children, and now it was something sinful and something tainted. It says, and they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. It's a very familiar story to us that God was calling in the garden, Adam, where are you? Adam, where are you? God is omnipotent. He has all knowledge. He has all power. He's omniscient. God knew exactly where Adam and Eve were hiding. He knew exactly what bush they were in. He wasn't asking, what is your location? You know, what's your longitude and latitude? He was asking, where are you in relationship to me? We had a relationship of intimacy and closeness, and now that's been broken. You've chosen rebellion and sin and broken fellowship with me. And so now all Adam and Eve had to show for their sin was shame and guilt and the burden of knowing that they had brought the curse of sin into the family of man. Now, uh, Luke chapter 19, verse 10, we learn that the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Luke chapter 19, verse 10. That word lost is, um, is more than... I, I've been lost lots of times. I get lost in city streets. I get lost 
sometimes in my own city. Uh, getting lost is a common human experience. This is not the weight of this word, though. The Greek word apollomi, for what lost means to destroy, to be utterly destroyed, to bring about an end. God says in his word, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which had been utterly destroyed, that which had been devastated by sin, that which had been brought to an end by rebellion. The Son of Man came to seek and save those who have been devastated and destroyed by sin. Now, uh, the good news is that reconciliation by Christ's blood is available now. Reconciliation by Christ's blood is necessary to establish peace with God. As Jesus Christ sought the lost, those who were destroyed and devastated and ruined by sin, he also provided a way whereby they could once again be cleansed to the point of holiness that they could know their holy God. Ephesians 2, 13 and 16 says, But now in Christ Jesus... You who are once far off, hiding in the bushes of the garden, you who have once fled from God to, to nurture and tend your own sin, those who fled from God have now been brought near by the blood of Christ, restored to garden intimacy, and that Jesus did this to reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. I think it's fascinating that in the book of Romans chapter 5, the representation is this, that while we were still God's enemies, Christ died for us. It's not that we were apathetic or just distracted. It's that we are positioned as the enemies of God. There is hostility in our relationship to God until there is repentance and seeking of God and the forgiveness of the blood of the cross. This came about because of the fall of man in the garden. That's how important Genesis 1 through 12 is. It teaches us why we needed a Savior, why we needed Jesus Christ. And what Jesus Christ came to do was to seek and to save those who had been utterly destroyed by sin. Now, Isaiah 59, 1 and 2, I, just, I inserted this because I love this passage. <laughs> but it really sums this all up. It says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that I cannot save, or his ear dull, that I cannot hear, but your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God. It's sin that separates us from God. And your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. There's no communication in prayer between those who are dead in sin and God. There is only this word of conviction and drawing, drawing people to the cross that they might be restored and forgiven and saved. Okay? Now... Number five, since the fall, since that day until now, all mankind is submitted to the flesh, sin, and death. We, we think there are Christians and then there are those who are just kind of confused and doing their own thing, but that's not what the, world, what the Word says. The Word says that just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, so death spread to all mankind, because all sinned. Romans 3.23, I'm sure we all have that memorized, for all have sinned and all fall short of the glory of God. All mankind is now submitted to the flesh, to sin, and to death. Even the best and most altruistic do-gooders do in our culture are serving the flesh. They are all submitted to the flesh, to sin, and to death. Now, uh, Romans 16 uh, uh, um, Roman, uh, verse 17 says, Sin is the lost person's master. It's not a neutrality. There's not a neutrality among the lost. It's not like they're just neutral. They're lost and they're actually hostile in their mind toward God and toward his ways and toward his laws. You see, the word presents it this way, that since the fall, we are either slaves to God or slaves to sin. If we're slaves to sin, we're destructive to ourselves and to all those around us. If we're servants of God, then we are living in fellowship with the living God, and we are truly alive. Sin is a lost person's master. It says this, You are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God 
that you who are once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. Those who are born again, those who come to know Christ, have their sins forgiven, and now Jesus Christ is their master, and he's a benevolent, loving master who only wants to grow us into the image of Christ Jesus. Now, um, this, this to me is the most important piece in the doctrine of mankind, and this is something that we have to really understand, especially from the book of Romans, that lost people aren't just sick in need of healing. They're not just confused. They're not just self-destructive. They're not just distant from God. They're not just lacking knowledge. Lost people are dead. They're spiritually dead. The Bible presents them as spiritually dead. They have no spiritual life. None at all. In fact, I think uh, our culture's recent fascination with the zombies is amazing. Because I, if I was to say this imagery in the Bible, what it most reminds me of is that we're living in a planet full of zombies that have no spiritual initiative, no relationship with God. They're spiritually dead. They're spiritually flatlined. It says this in 1 Corinthians 15, So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. For those who come to know Christ Jesus, what Jesus has given them is life, is spiritual life. When Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. He is spiritual life. Knowing him is spiritual life. He is living water and bread to us. When we come to know him, that part of us comes alive that had been dead. So remember this, when we share the gospel with the lost, that we're talking to somebody who has no spiritual discernment. They have no spiritual contact with God. They have deceived worldviews, deceived religious systems, but they have no relationship with God. The gift that God brings is the conviction of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit was given to convict of sin and righteousness and judgment. That's the first act of communication from God to a lost man, is to convict of sin that we might repent and that we might be made truly alive. Another interesting thing, too, is to realize what we're talking about here is not temporary life, not a better life. We're talking about an eternal life. That when we give our lives to Jesus Christ, he makes us alive, not just for that moment, but forever and ever and ever. Amen. That is the created order. That was the intention of God. And now God has what he had first desired, relationship with people that he created by restoring them through the blood of Christ. <clears throat> the, uh, they were cast out of the garden. The garden of Eden was never to be seen again. Uh, it was locked away and guarded by cherubim. And those of you that have read the book of Ezekiel or realized that the four living creatures that attend the throne of God, these creatures are the weirdest looking things in the whole world. If one was to appear right here right now, we would probably all fall over and die from coronaries. A horrifying, amazing, otherworldly creatures. They were created by God to attend the throne. And one of these magnificent beasts with three different kinds of faces was placed at the gate of the garden with a moving sword, preventing people from ever entering it or seeing it again. They were cast out of the garden, which was locked away and guarded by cherubim. It says this, He drove out the man... And at the east of the Garden of Eden, he placed a cherubim with a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. What God has locked shut will never be opened again. The Garden of Eden is done. That perfect terrarium, that perfect environment that God created for the dwelling of mankind, that perfect place of rest and peace, it was lost in that one moment where temptation was yielded to, and he drove them out. Now, Number seven, since then, all generations are born physically alive, but spiritually dead. They're born with hearts beating and minds operating and limbs working. They're born with an appearance of life, but no spiritual life. It says in Ephesians 2, verses 1 and 2, this is from the, the Holman Standard Bible. It says, and you were dead. You were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you previously walked according to the ways of this world, according to the ruler who exercises authority 
over the lower heavens. The Spirit now working in the disobedience. Satan is still doing his work of deceiving. He is still speaking to the hearts of dead men and women to keep them from seeing the truth of God. But all generations of mankind born since the fall were born alive in body and dead in spirit. And what we're given at our salvation is a spiritual life, the ability, the capacity to know God, to worship Him, to pray, to grow, to have Him at work in leading us and guiding us in our lives. This is Omega Centauri, by the way, if you've been picking, picking a note of the, uh, of the Hubble telescope pictures. We know that the result in Scripture is painfully clear. The result of the fall, the result of the sin that entered mankind. And here it is. We are all born in a sinful state. Again, it's called congenital sin. And we all choose to sin as well. We are both sinners by birth and sinners by choice and by intention. All right, so that's the result. This is part of the doctrine of mankind. If we're going to understand what the Bible is saying to people, we've got to understand this is the starting point. The creation, the garden, the perfection of God's intention and love, the goodness of his creation, all that lost in a moment when Adam and Eve chose rebellious sin. And since then, we're all born in the same condition, spiritually dead, spiritually flatlined, and waiting and longing for a Savior. This, by the way, to me, as you're sharing the gospel with the lost, as you're talking to people in this lost world, I think it's the most easily demonstrable, easily observable aspect of the gospel. I don't know anybody who doesn't admit that mankind is sinful. I don't know anybody who won't admit that they've done things wrong in their life. This is the place where the gospel is absolutely manifest all around us. And even if people don't think they're sinful, ask their wife, ask their husband, ask the people who know them. It is the most easily observable aspect of the gospel that mankind is flatlined, dead, sin, and selfish. And we all blow it. We all violate the Ten Commandments over and over again. We all sin and rebel. It's what we do because it is in the job description of lost people to sin, to rebel. It's the most easily demonstrable aspect of the gospel. And when we talk to people about their lostness, many people will say that they understand that they are sinful, that they do bad things. Now, the, the next step is this, to say that now you know that you've fallen, that you've lost everything through the fall of mankind, and that you're sinful and rebellious by nature. You need to understand there is a Savior, there is a Redeemer, and you can be made new. But this certainly is the most easy thing to demonstrate. I think when we're talking to people about their lostness, I think it's extremely important that we all affirm the fact that we are all card-carrying sinners, that we are all sinners who were saved by grace, and that grace is available to everyone who comes. Number two, we are all born separated from God and unable to work toward restoration on our own. There's nothing that we can do to a baby, to an infant. There's no ordinance. There's no practice that we can do that will make them come alive in the Spirit. They come alive in the Spirit the day that they turn their hearts and lives over to Jesus Christ. We're all born separated from God, unable to work toward restoration on our own. There's no effort of will or flesh or behavior that we can exert to perfect ourselves enough to make ourselves acceptable to God because we are spiritually dead and in a position of hostility toward God. And then here are the singing words of the book of Ephesians. Uh, and I hope we all have this memorized too. That is by grace we've been saved. We didn't earn it. We didn't deserve it. And we've been saved through faith, through believing in him. This is not your own doing. It's the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. We were spiritually flatlined since the garden. The doctrine of mankind informs us that all the generations of mankind who've lived separated from God, lived and died in separation from God. But those who received grace through faith, who received Jesus Christ, were made alive in the Spirit and were, were revitalized to know God and to begin to grow and to begin walking with Him and worshiping Him in preparation for eternity. This is the Crab Nebula, by the way. All this stuff's just up there to the glory of God. <laughs> um, this is, this is really important, too, that the depth of our depravity, the depth of the deadness of our souls, the depth of our spiritual flatline nature, 
leaves no possibility of a workspace salvation. There's nothing we can do to perfect ourselves. There's nothing we can do to correct the wrong that was done in the garden and then the wrongs that we've done in our lives. There's nothing. It's outside of our power. We're entirely incapable. All we can do is have the shocking revelation that we are sinners in rebellion to God. We are sinners dead in the Spirit. Galatians 3 says this, For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. There were generations of people who thought, if I can only perfectly keep the Ten Commandments, then all will be well. But no one has ever been able to perfectly keep all the Ten Commandments. For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse still. The curse came in in the garden, and now we still live under this curse. For it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all the things written in the books of the law, and do them. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. The Apostle Paul reveals to us in the book of Romans that, that the law, the Ten Commandments, was more than just a guidebook to help life be lived more successfully. The law was given to teach us that we cannot keep the law. The God law was given to reveal to us our sinful state. The law was given to us to show us that we needed a new covenant, that there was no way to perfect our way to knowing God. All right? Now, <clears throat> this is a, a fantastic little verse, Matthew chapter 9, verse 36, about Jesus Christ and his compassion on the lost, his compassion and love for those who are separated and dead in spirit. It says, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. This is important because they harassed and helpless. Jesus is acknowledging that this lost bunch of wandering sheep that had no shepherd, they're helpless. They can't do anything to fix themselves. All they can do is continue to repeat cycles of sin. And even their good deeds are done out of selfish motives. He had compassion on them because, not because of the great potential they showed, but he had compassion on them because they were utterly helpless. Since the garden, we have been spiritually utterly helpless, and we have needed a Savior. Now, number three, we are still born under the curse of sin and death. And like I said, it's kind of something we have to be careful about and thinking and talking about because uh, there's some new mom or new grandpa that's liable to pound us into a puddle. But the fact of the matter is, those babies in your arms are born spiritually dead, and they are in sin already. And uh, as we grow them, if we're parents of the covenant, we're teaching them more and more about God, that one day they might give their lives to Jesus Christ and be born again too. But we are all born under the curse of sin and death. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 50 through 58, reveals that, this curse on our lives. Romans 5.12 says this, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, so death spread to all men, because all sinned. This passage is in here twice because I think it's so important that we realize this, that we realize when we're dealing with the doctrine of mankind, the final analysis is this, that to simplify things, there's two messages in the Bible. The two messages are this, that number one, man's outright rebellion and sin and deadness of spirit and life. Sin is the one message. The next message is grace, the love of God shown by Jesus Christ on the cross. And when you look at the Word of God through those two grids, what we're saying here is that that whole world, the whole world apart from God, is bound by sin. And sin spreads. It spreads death. And we need a Savior. We're all born under this curse of sin and death. Oops, I, I fast-forwarded too far. Uh, we're all born under the curse of sin and death. Now, the Word of God is very clear about this. You talk about the doctrine of mankind, we have to talk about beginnings and creation and the fall and redemption. We also have to talk about what happens when people do not come to know Jesus Christ, when they reject the offer of salvation. And this is what I want you to know. We will all be eternally separated from God in hell if our sinful condition is not corrected by the blood of Christ. It is the destination for all the lost. It says in Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 through 15, that I actually selected out verse 5. It says, If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. 
the word of God is very clear that hell is the destination for those who reject the grace of God. And the only hope that we have of exploding out of the spiritually dead state into life forevermore is having a relationship with Jesus Christ. This is a quote from Jonathan Edwards. <clears throat> I think that, um, once again, dealing with the doctrine of mankind, we need to realize that, uh, that there is this truth that is the rock-solid truth of the whole Word of God, that when we come to Jesus Christ to be saved, that we contribute nothing. We contribute no works, no beauty, no value. All we bring is deadness of soul and the bondage of sin to be released by the grace of God, by the love and benevolence of God. Jonathan Edwards said, you contribute nothing to your salvation but the sin that made it necessary. That's why when we come to Jesus Christ for salvation, we have to come in a place of broken humility, admitting our sin and our need. Because the only thing we bring is our unworthiness. The only thing we bring is our helplessness. The only thing we bring is our sin. And what Jesus Christ has addressed is the sin problem and forgiveness that we'd be reunited with the Father. Now, this actually looked like Simi Valley for a while there, till this last winter. But uh, this is interesting because the fall affected more than just Adam and Eve, more than just you and I. The fall affected all of creation. And now the whole creation is paying the price, the entropy, the chaos, the disorder that's come into the world as the result of sin. It's clearly linked right back to the garden and to Adam and Eve. And as we understand what's happened to creation, what's happening to the world, to weather patterns, to earthquakes, to, flower, to, to floods, tornadoes, all the natural disasters, tsunamis, all the things we see happening around us and the nervousness we have about all this, we have to realize that if there is this change taking place and this decay is all around us, it's as a result of sin the sin from the garden, the decay that entered not just mankind, but all of creation. It affected everyone and everything that God had created good. Listen to this, Romans 8, verses 20 through 22. For the whole creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. That's, that's a very artistic thing that God does to the Apostle Paul in in making creation personified like it's a person. The whole creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of men. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly. You see, it wasn't, it wasn't the earth that fell. It was Adam and Eve that fell, and the earth paid the price for that fall. But because of him who objected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free. One day the creation itself will be set free from its bondage, corruption, and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. One day there will be a new, a recreated heaven and a new and recreated earth. And we look forward to those days. But as now, uh, all creation groans and waits eagerly with us for the day of redemption. So that is what I have to present to you in terms of the fall and the penalty and the price that was paid. This is, uh, uh, this is a heavy message, but it is the truth of God's word. And if we're going to understand and embrace all of the truth of God and begin our ministries and begin our family lives from a firm foundation, it has to go all the way back to Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. In the beginning, God created. We have to understand the goodness of God's creation. We have to understand the wickedness of the fall of Adam and Eve, that in a perfect place of rest and peace and joy with God, that they chose the one, the one sin that was denied them, the one peace that was, that was restricted from them. They chose that one act of disobedience and disloyalty that brought sin into all humanity. And since then, people have been dead and bound to a curse and to this sin. And all of us, apart from Christ, are in bondage and slaves to sin. And then we see the act of recreation in Jesus Christ, the second covenantal head of humanity. Adam, the first covenantal head, who sinned and brought bondage and death into creation. And then Jesus Christ, who refused sin and walked in purity and holiness and offered redemption. All the way up to until the end, where the judgment takes place, 
and there is an actual hell for those who have refused and rejected Jesus Christ, and there is a heaven promised for those who have humbled themselves and repented and turned to Jesus Christ. All creation groans with us, but next week will be a little better news. But this is where the doctrine of mankind has to land. This is where it's got to live. This is what we've got to understand. Apart from these truths, there's no, there's nothing propelling us forward in the gospel. There's no, nothing propelling us forward even in worship. We worship God not because we're so good. We worship God because of the grace we've received, the gifts of forgiveness and life that were given freely, not because we made ourselves right, but in spite of all of our sin. So we worship God for these things. I'm going to lead us in a word of prayer, and then we'll go into our second uh, session in our group times. And I hope the questions are helpful to you. Thank you for being with us tonight. I hope you all uh, TiVo the address of the nation. And I know that we are under some pretty heavy competition with the President of the United States. But those of you that chose to study the doctrine of mankind, I'm praying that God will return a blessing to your life for having chosen a better thing. Thank you, Father God, for the, the grace and the love that you have shown us. Thank you, God, that in spite of our helpless and our devastated dead estate apart from you, that you sent your Holy Spirit to convict us and to draw us. Thank you, God, that you allowed the image to remain in us, marred, marred maybe and, and tainted, but you allowed the image to remain in us that once saved, you could begin restoring the image of Christ Jesus in us. And that each and every day, you are on board and you are resident in our hearts and you're bringing about change and transformation for the day that we'll be glorified in heaven. We thank you, God, for the truth of your word. We thank you, God, that in spite of the lies that surround us, we know the truth that in him is life and that life is the light of all men. We give you praise in Jesus Christ and we pray these things. Amen.